this is a poem I wrote uh, back in 2010. And as we can see, the times are really, really tense, right? We have Trump, we have all these white supremacists going crazy. Um, but this is a poem about us embracing who we are, where we are, and where we're going. So the way this works, I say the first line, and then you guys repeat, okay? So this is an affirmation that I like to say every day for us to take power of what has been robbed from us, okay? So it starts with this line, and then you repeat. So I say it, and then you repeat. I am an original inhabitant of this land. I am an original inhabitant of this land. I am not an illegal alien. I am not an illegal alien. I am not a foreigner on this land. I am not a foreigner on this land. I am indigenous. I am indigenous. I am beautiful. I am beautiful. I am brown. I am brown. I am light brown. I am light brown. I am dark brown. I am dark brown. I am beautiful. I am beautiful. I have the right to be free. I have the right to be free. I have the right to be me. I have the right to be me. I have the right to walk on my continent. I have the right to walk on my continent. I love myself. I love myself. I love my community. I love my community. I love our people. I love our people. We're all one people. We're all one people. This is our land. This is our land. This is our continent. This is our continent. This is our land. This is our land. This is our continent. This is our continent. Beautiful. Thank you. Because again, the media tells us every day, illegal, uh, they're trying to get rid of TV, TV um, There's a lot of immigration going on against our people, but what we have to realize is that we belong on this continent. Whether we're migrating from Central America, from Tierra del Fuego, from a Diné reservation, this continent ancestrally, traditionally belongs to us. The title of my talk today is Decolonization and Education of a Young Mexicana in Los Angeles. I'm going to explain why I put Mexicana in quotations. I'm the founder of Nicantlaca University, an online resource, and also the activist group Nicantlaca Women Warriors. So a little bit about what I grew up on. I'm from 82, so I'm a little bit older than most of you here. Um, what did I grow up seeing? I grew up with what is known as the LA riots what we would like to call the uh, LA uprising. Exactly, right? Yeah, so that's what happened. So the media obviously portrayed it as it's a riot, these people are looting, and it goes into the whole trope of black rage, right? And black violence, people of color are just crazy and they have no right to be upset. But this is what I was seeing. I was 10 years old when I was seeing this. I was in Cudahy, California. I was filling up little gallons of water because I was afraid that they were gonna come over to my side. And so I didn't understand, right, the social economic backdrop to what was going on. My mom was, she couldn't really explain what was going on, but I remember this was very tra traumatic for me at that time because I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what the, what the background to this was. Also, do you guys remember 1994? Probably not. <laughs> Uh, but there was something called Proposition 187. Proposition 187 was a California ballot um, that deprived undocumented people of state services. And I want to share with you a commercial that I saw. Uh, 1994, I remember I was in junior high at this time. I'm from Huntington Park. And I watched this, and compared to the type of news that we get now, I think we can all relate to this type of rhetoric. I hope it plays. <laughs> So this is a commercial that was on. Two million illegal immigrants in California. The federal government won't stop them at the border, yet requires us to pay billions to take care of them. Governor Pete Wilson sent the National Guard to help the Border Patrol. But that's not all. For Californians who work hard, pay taxes, and obey the laws, I'm suing to force the federal government to control the border. And I'm working to deny state services to illegal immigrants. Enough is enough. Governor Pete Wilson. Sound familiar? Trump. Right? What does that remind you of? Right? Trump, right? And the border wall, right? So if you guys can see what's happening right now, right? We can try, it goes way back to this. We're going to get into that. But this is what I'm seeing, right? I'm growing up and I'm like, what the heck? Like, they, they're talking about us like we're roaches. Like, what did I do? Like, you felt like you didn't belong. You felt like a criminal. You're looking at your mom like, what's she do? You know? Cause this rhetoric, they're criminalizing your grandma, they're criminalizing your whole community and the way that they're talking about this. And yet, us as a people, we don't have that awareness. We don't have like to be able to say, wait a second, where's this coming from? This is not 
right for us to be living this if we actually have our heritage and our connections and our roots are here. Um, this is another link, but I'm going to skip that one. But you, you get the idea to say that this is what I was watching. There's There was walkouts um, happening all over LA. It was, uh, I have a picture here of Fresno, walkout in Fresno. In Huntington Park, they had a lot of city hall meetings about that. Um, and then, what else am I watching, right? What are, we, what are we watching on TV? You're all familiar with this, right? Right? What, what is she? Who is she? Okay. And then over here, we have like, sure, all these novelas, right? Can someone explain to me what Lady Maria does or what she represents? Anybody to start off? No wrong word. Does she make when you look at Lady Maria, right? And you look like her, right? And your mom looks like her. And what do you walk away with feeling when you see this? You know, they make fun of her, right? She's kind of like the the jokester. Um, I grew up seeing her in her movies, so I am familiar with it. But what does that make you feel as someone that looks like this? We can turn on the TV today, right? Like Channel 34 and Channel 52. Like these novelas continue to carry that narrative, right? Who, who are the ones that are usually cleaning in the novelas? Yeah. Right? The Mexican, the darker skinned women, right? Who are the ones, the chingona, the tacaros del año, and like wow. get the men? The bleach blonde, some of these actresses are actually straight white from uh, Brazil, from Colombia. So, you know, so we're seeing, like, what's the portrayal being given, right, of uh, being Mexican, Central American, South American. And this is, this is traumatic. Like, right now we might not think about it, but if you're socialized every day to watch this, you start developing certain ideas about who you are, about who your people are. And also, what are we being called, right? What are we being called? Um, before 1970s, all Mexican, Central American, South Americans, we were all just considered white. There was no different category, it was all just white. Well, in the late 70s, they actually created, the US Census created a long form a questionnaire, and they came up with the concept of Hispanic and the concept of Latino. So according to Miriam Webster, um, Hispanic is our relating to the people, speech, or culture of Spain, Latino is a native or inhabitant of Latin America, or a person of Latin American origin living in the U.S. And so what we're looking at here is the government trying to categorize who are all these people, right? They're not white, they're speaking Spanish. Um, let's just group them all together, and I'll get to the problem with that. All right, so let's talk about Spanish, right? The Hispanic, the definition means a person, I think, of Spain, right? Who, do you guys recognize this guy? Ana Cortez, this guy? Ese. <laughs> and then here, we're looking at the Spanish Empire, Spanish conquest, right? So under this logic, us that are Mexican, Central American, uh, South American descent, simply speaking Spanish, right, we're being called Hispanic. So that means that all of us right now, we're communicating in English, right? There's some of the poetry in English. So that means that we're Britannic then, right? Or that African Americans, Asian Americans, that by large have a lot of uh, English surnames, speak English. So that must mean that if we apply this logic that's been used to us, then that must mean that they're Britannic, right? Why not, right? So let's get into the real meanings of it. And this is important to me because, again, when we're born into this culture, we assume things have always been like that, that we naturalize it, right? We naturalize this knowledge, these ethnicities, these identities. Well, let's get into Latin. Latin is actually Southern Europeans. It was the Latin Romanian language, which we don't even speak to today, right? So Latin is kind of like the, um, the foundation that gave root to all these other languages. So when we're called Latino, we're like, wait a second, well, if in Spanish or Hispanic, their logic is we speak Spanish, well, that doesn't work if you're saying Latino. And then if you look at the cultural markers behind Latino, it connects us to the Roman Empire, right? It connects us to the Latin language, to Rome. So I'm giving you this because I want us to challenge that a little bit. But let's get into the real background of these terms. It boils down to this. Latino and Hispanic are marketing tools, 
right? They make it seem like, oh yeah, you know, we all drink Coronas, we all celebrate Cinco de Mayo, we all, and all of that is all marketing. What happened was, in the late 70s, they were trying to market um, our population. And they're saying, instead of spending, you know, millions here, millions there, millions of that, because this is all marketing, and you guys are aware that they spend millions of dollars learning how to manufacture certain messages, certain products for consumers, right? And so they decided, okay, and there's actual reports on this, like tons and tons of reports. So basically, with Latino and Hispanic, it was a way to group all people who speak Spanish in one group. Corporations can target one audience at the same time and therefore maximize exposure and profit. There's a really good study that was done on ethnic marketing, and this is like, oh, blow your mind, because they're really talking about targeting, specifically uh, men of color, right? And targeting them with beer advertising, and how that's gonna give them the outcome of more money, right? So there's this whole system going on. It's presented, and you know, Cristina presents it as a nor normal phenomenon. Don Francisco presents it like it's all normal. But there's actually a lot of thinking going behind how we're being constructed as an identity. And I'm gonna get into what is, who are promoting these uh, agendas? Did we know that Don Francisco, whole name is actually Mario Luis Kritzenberger Blumenfield? Did you guys know that? You know, that doesn't sound too good, right? You know, no one present that, Don Kritzenberger, right? That doesn't work, right? So he is actually of European descent. She is actually of European descent, but that's what's considered a criollo. A criollo is someone that was born in the Americas, um, but that continued that Spanish elite um, family tree. That's who they represent. So. When they're trying to make it seem like, oh, it's Don Francisco, like if you're your uncle, you know, like Don Francisco, there's actually a whole other reality going on, right? Don Mario Luis Kritzenberger, Blumenfield. So before, let's go back, right? Let's go back, wait, wait, wait. Right? Let's go back. Before these identities, before even this country was established as America, what were we? What was this land called? Do we have that awareness? Um, how many of you are familiar with indigenous cultures of the Americas, right? The Maya, the Mexica, the Aztec, maybe, right? It's important when we're understanding our experience, our history, to go way back, right? Because these last 500 years of what we know, it's only like not even 2% of our entire history as a people. And so what I want to challenge you today is to erase those borders that we are used to seeing, right? We're used to saying United States, Central America, Mexico, Brazil, Uruguay. Let's go back, backtrack, backtrack. Our ancestors obviously had dozens and dozens, hundreds of languages through which we define our own uh, land, our own history, ourselves. In the Nahuatl tradition, which is a language that we speak today that we don't even know we speak. Let me introduce you. When you say, no te agüites, el sacate, dame un popote. El papalote. Those are what? Spanish? No. No. They're Nahuas. Right? So you're speaking now. We don't even know it. Right? It's a language that has survived century after century after century. Tawatinsuyu. This is down to what is called South America. Comes from a civilization down with Peru, the Inca. Right? So we have to honor that, those languages and that terminology and that perspective of who we are. Again, accomplishments. I want to suggest this awesome book for you guys, American Indian Contributions to the World. This is an awesome encyclopedia book talking about the different contributions that our ancestors gave the world. Usually when we think of indigenous cultures, what are some of the stereotypes that we hear? Very dumb. Dumb. Uh, the Human sacrifices, right? <laughs> right? Living in teepees, all of us living in teepees, right? Worshiping the sun, the moon, right? It's very superficial because, again, we have a very superficial portrayal of our culture in media. So just a, just a list, a very small list, of the contributions of our ancestors. And you guys can read most of them on here. Uh, but the most important one is that we created one of the original three world civilizations. And that's really important because nowadays, it's very common for people to say, 
oh, you know, those aliens, you know? They must have been to the Mayan region because it's just, it's just too crazy. How is it so precise that the Mayan architecture or Mayan astronomy was able to be so precise? It's called intelligence. It's called scientific observation. They don't do that about other cultures, right? They don't say that about what is designated as a white civilization or white culture. But somehow, when it comes to our accomplishments, our civilization as a people, they make that, they take that liberty, right? Or it was the Africans. Or it was the aliens. And it's like, why not say our ancestors were smart people, they created magnificent civilizations, just like all these other groups of people all over the world, right? And that shows you the narrative, how we are viewed, how our ancestors are viewed, as far as intelligence and sciences. And again, there's a whole encyclopedia book that I would strongly recommend to read more about that. So, here comes the other part, right? Why don't we know this? Why isn't this normalized education, K through 12? Why do we not even identify as being uh, indigenous or even part indigenous? It's because of this. This system of before European borders and colonial nationalism, this is the example I want to give you, right? We tend to say, oh, where are you from? We're Mexican, I'm Central American, I'm Salvadorian. Those creations, those countries, are very new creations. We have in uh, Mexico, the independence of the new Spain was 1821. You have the creation of the Republic of Central America, which was when the whole region was considered one republic, 1823 to 1838. Then they, they broke off and became their own, I, you know, their own nationalities in 1838. So what we have here, this year, and then we also think, oh, Mexican independence, right, September 16th. But in reality, what we have is what happened to the U.S. What happens to the United States when, you guys know, I'm sure you guys know this history, right? How did the United States become independent? <clears throat> what was it? The War of Independence. Exactly. Right, and who was fighting, who, who was the, who were, who were the main ones fighting? The, the, the colonies and Britain. Exactly. Yeah, right? So let's take that example and attribute it to what happened to our ancestors on this side, right? So what we have on this side going on is we have criollos or the Spanish that originally invaded never left, right? And they fought for independence because they were tired of giving tribute to Spain, to, um, to their motherland. And so what they did is create um, independent nations through which they could be able to continue to, you know, to be completely profitable without having to give that money back and that tax back to Spain. So this is really, really important, right? Because we take this as, oh yeah, it's always going like that. No, this is very new uh, construction of nationality. And that's why in my studies and what I've come to determine is colonialism does not define us. To me, in my studies what I'm doing, these terms don't honor our ancestors. They don't honor our experience if you're looking at the entire existence as a, as a people. And genocide. This is really, really, really important. What genocides do we know of? What genocide are you familiar with? Armenian. Armenian. Okay, what are the genocides? Jewish, Jewish. Jewish, right? What are the genocides? Native American. Native American, okay. Native American, okay. Native American. What is it? Native American. What is that? Who is that? Um, what place is that? The, well, Ukraine. The Ukraine oh. came during the USSR was for to start. About many died. Okay, good. Thank you. Yes. Right? Okay, let me let me kind of give you a little um, background to this. So, recommended for you, and a lot of the things, is this genocide, we don't learn about in school, right? I just did a study in my grad seminar tracing what genocides are, are actually included in textbooks and which ones are not. And this genocide is not even considered genocide, right? It's the battles. It's the native battles. It's the Western expansion. It's Manifest Destiny. And even the newer ones are trying to be a little bit more, you know, just. They kind of talk about uh, the devastation, right? But devastation and genocide, that's very different. Yeah, it's devastating. But the accounts of the genocide. Yes. Yeah. Uh, when Columbus first landed, did he just kill off a bunch of those people, those people in the, those areas, like millions of people? Yes, absolutely. Uh, in Hispaniola, they actually they have documented that no, I did no indigenous population survived. 
So there's parts of the whole Western Hemisphere that we would never even know the name of those indigenous populations. And I want to recommend that you guys read, there's more, there's more research made on this. American Holocaust is, I would think, the best book if you guys want to learn more about um, the genocide, the numbers, the figures, and all of this, let me tell you, it's not people going back and, you know, kind of thinking about it or putting to the facts together. No, this is actually written by the Spanish and other Europeans, the Portuguese. They wrote down, right, what was happening. Um, obviously, we have to be very critical about what they wrote, but they were not ashamed. This was part of... This is how you dealt with people that you don't consider human, right? You kill 95% of them and you're just like, oh man, we shouldn't kill them all because who's gonna do our work? Who's gonna do our slave labor? So I really recommend American Holocaust by David E. Stanner. As you can see, I put more work in this book. Um, this one, Violence Over the Land, it's really well done. It's by Ned Blackhawk. This talks about more the Eastern experience of indigenous people and the most recent one is The Other Slavery, right? This one is, I think it's 2014. I would say this is probably the best contribution given to studying our history because it actually uses the term slavery. Because when we think of slavery, right, we usually think African slavery, right? And he actually goes into it saying that indigenous slavery was able to coexist as African slavery, but it was in the cultural dynamics that the Spanish introduced it. So it's really well done. So if you guys are interested in that. And then we have some images of the actual primary sources that were taken at the time of the invasion. We have burning of books, destruction of universities. We have massacre of our people. Like this is just the violence, right? The physical violence. But there's a lot more to genocide. So what I was curious to know was who came up with the term genocide? What does this mean? Like, why, why are we called, you know, survivors of genocide? Or why, is it, why don't we have a museum of tolerance, right? We're the majority in LA, in California, we're gonna be a greater majority. What, why is our experience not making it, right, to these narratives? And so this is what I found out, right? Rafael Lemkin, he was a Polish Jew, right? He came up with the concept of genocide during the Jewish Holocaust. At the time where he didn't know the mass, the massive numbers or the extreme uh, experiences that the Jews were experiencing, he was he just knew that this was wrong and that there should be some type of accountability for how different people, different ethnic groups, different religious groups are being treated. And then he it gets even more um, surprising. So just just to define it, can someone read this to me? What the def definition of genocide is? Somebody want to read it? To me? Uh, genocide, genocide is defined as the planned annihilation of a national or a racial group by a variety of actions aimed at undermining the foundation essential to the survival of the group as a group. Okay. So that's the official definition of genocide, right? So let's get into it. Let's talk about genocide. And the most important thing is that Raphael Lemkin, when he was writing right, his research papers, he was studying the experiences of indigenous people. He studied the Mexica, which are known as the Aztec. He studied the Native Americans. He studied all these groups. And then explaining what genocide was, he was saying, what's happening to the Jews is much like what happened to the Native Americans, much like what happened to the Inca, much like what happened to the Mexica. So you're like, wait a second. So if the man himself who coined the term genocide is using our experience as a qualification of what it means to be a victim of genocide, why is it that today this concept is not attributed to our experience as a people, right? That's mind-blowing. That's like, how is this possible, right? So just a, a few examples. This is pretty long. There's uh, five sections under genocide. We have killing members of the group. Obviously, we have the massive amount of killings that were done through biological warfare. Many to this day say the Spanish didn't know what they were doing. We just died. We're like, oops, they died. I don't know what's going on. That's bogus. Because biological warfare was being used in Europe. Biological warfare, they were using against each other for centuries. It's a concept that they knew. It's a concept that they understood. Yeah, mind you, we may not, they may not have the scientific labs and all this to determine the microorganisms and all that. But the idea 
uh, biological warfare, that's been existing. So for them to say that all of a sudden they're in the Americas and they have no idea why these Indians are dying, right? And then I have also studied how the very particular populations were being killed off first. Isn't it interesting that those indigenous populations that actually fought with the Spanish after they fought them, those didn't die of smallpox. But those that were resisting and actually fighting them, those died of smallpox. Hmm, is that a coincidence? No, it's intentional. Then we have uh, Section T, causing serious bodily or mental harm. Obviously, we can trace it from the very initial invasion up into the Indian schools, right, on the reservations and that experience. Then we have deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction. We have, again, we have a psychological trauma of Indian schools, the psychological trauma of being persecuted for practicing your own religion. And this happened throughout the Americas, not just what I'm mentioning, the Indian schools. And then we have a picture of the Bracero program. And I'm, I'm making the connection. I'm not just thinking to one century. I'm saying this practice, right, of genocide continues, right? Did it stop in, what, 1992, 1998? This one, D, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. This documentary just came out two, about two, three years ago, right? This documentary is about um, the 1960s and 70s, Mexican immigrant women alleged they were coercively sterilized without their consent at the LAC and USC Medical Center. You guys know where that's at? USC Hospital, right? So this is a documentary that shows that the doctors, and the, when the, these women were going into labor, right? They're in their pains, they're like, they can't, they're about to go into labor. And the doctors are like, oh, do you want to get sterilized? They want to, not in Spanish, a lot of these women did not understand English. So what was happening is, they're going in to deliver a baby, they come out sterilized, right? This is one example of how our births are being prevented, right? This is not 200 years ago. This is recent, and this is a documentary that had enough evidence. There's a lot more in other communities that experience the same thing. And the last one, E, forcibly transferring children of one group to another group. And we have the experience of the boarding schools. You guys familiar with the boarding schools? The Indian schools? No, basically, um, this happened again throughout the Americas, but basically, you were stolen from your family put over to a missionary school, and you never saw your family again. Sometimes a lot of the, the death rates, the sexual abuse molestation rates in those schools are skyrocketing. And all that information is coming out because the actual survivors at that time, there's a lot of uh, interviews with them about what they remember growing up. And the most important thing is that Lemkin said that it's not just the actual killing, right? And it's not just the actual physical killing of people, but it's also the non-lethal acts that also constitute genocide. When they destroy your economic independence, when they destroy your language, when they destroy your religion, your culture. So do you guys know how we learned Spanish and English? What that process was like? Uh, they, yeah. would, um, they would force their language and their religion onto the indigenous people, and especially in South America. Yeah. When, um, Christopher Columbus came over here, yep. and he would he would kill anybody who resisted their um, their culture and the implications of what they wanted to wanted them to believe in their culture. So they like they burned all their books, they burned they burned yep. anything that had to do with their culture, and made sure that they learned what they had to do. Yep. Absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely, and there's actual laws. I have a lot of other data that show this, but there were actual laws passed by New Spain. In 1577, they passed a law to forbid indigenous knowledge. Obviously, there goes culture and language. They would go town to town. This is the initial century, 16th century, 17th century. They would go town to town into every home, make sure that you had no indigenous objects, that you weren't worshiping any other manifestation but the symbols of Christianity. And if you were found to be in possession of any of those artifacts or any of those things, you were publicly executed. And this happened for a century, maybe about over a century. So imagine initially, that's what you're seeing. You're seeing a complete destruction and persecution of your identity. And obviously, the learning of the Spanish language. And then, eventually, we get the English, which is 
the Native American experience, right? We're all indigenous, it's just that a ellos les tocaron the Europeans that speak English and nosotros the ones that speak Spanish, right? That is the common experience that we have. So I wanted to make like, kind of like to explain this. A lot of people were like, what are you talking about? Like, how am I indigenous? Like, I'm like super light-skinned. Like, how does this make me indigenous? Well, let me ask you this. What other ethnic group demands blood quantum for them to be respected as that identity that they're asserting? Right? Why are we, why do we have to come up with all these receipts and like, oh, well, my tribal card and my native card? Why is it that we're expected to prove our indigenous blood? Right? In the black community, one drop black, black is black. Right? To us, it's just, I don't know, like, my great grandpa came from Spain, you know, like, we have, we have this confusion, right? It's really conflicting. But the research that I'm, I'm doing, that I'm following up, is that obviously 95% of our population was wiped out. And this is massive, not, not just in Mexico, Central America, but we're talking about the entire America. So the 5% go on to be, right, Spanish, uh, speaking Spanish, right? forced to denounce our indigenous um, belief systems. And those of us that survived are under this branding of colonial identities. And this whole nationalism kind of contains those identities. And that put nationalism was created as a system to organize colonized lands and claim colonized people as legitimate subjects. And then we come up with this, right? We're going to explore that a little bit. Let's talk about this. Right? What do we hear about the Mexican conquest? What does it mean? Let's talk about the myths. What do you hear? La raza, right? Una nueva raza. That thanks to the Spanish, we're no una nueva raza. When does Mexico celebrate Dia de la Raza? Do you guys know the day? Yeah, I think they have a date. October 12th. So in Mexico. That's not, they don't celebrate Dia de la Raza, it's Christmas and Columbus Day. Here we do. Here it's called Christopher Columbus Day. In Mexico, it's called Dia de la Raza. Get it? So, isn't that interesting? Like, here it's called Columbus Day, right? And then Mexico, they have this thing called Dia de la Raza on October 12th. So, when, this is a myth, right? We're being presented like all this beautiful coming together, and all the Native women just dance into the European arms, and it was like, that's it. That's how Mexico became Mexico, right? That's what we're taught. That's very interesting, very, very uh, pink, right? Pocahontas comes to mind. Shell from the Roto Dorado. You guys have seen this. It's a Steven Spielberg cartoon about the treasures of El Dorado. Um, then we have art, right? Art that portrays the Spanish as gods, which has been debunked. Um, and if you're interested, I can share that information with you. So we, what does this tell us about the indigenous people that were here? You know, do they matter? The uh, Spanish has made themselves seem as gods to these people. The, the Spanish, they, in the Spanish people mind, they thought, we're new here, we're gods, because they can't match up to us. They're not like us, so in fact, they're inferior and many. The, the studies that I've made, they actually constructed that myth of, a, of Cortez being a god way after the conquest. And, I, and actually, what really happened was when the Mexica, the initial contact, the Mexica were in contact with the people that were fighting the Spanish. So since the Spanish arrived, they been they were getting resistance. The Tlaxcalteca, before they allied with them, they were fighting them. They were constantly being confronted, right? But that doesn't make it. We just hear that they made it to Tenochtitlan, and Motecuzoma was like, God, Cortez, you're back, right? And that's very purposeful. It's very purposeful because you want to dilute any type of resistance to what actually took place. We don't know that the Tlaxcaltecas fought the Spanish twice before they became allies. We don't know that Montecuzoma was actually spying on, on Cortez and his men as they were making their way over to Tenochtitlan. Right? And let me give you the best example of Raza Cosmica. Jose Vasconcelos. He was the um, Minister of Education of Mexico after the Mexican Revolution. He wanted to redefine Mexican culture and identity. He wrote a book called La Raza Cosmica. I challenge you and ask you to please read this book. It's not that long. It's maybe like, maybe 100 pages. 
It is the most racist, eugenist book produced in Mexico in the early 20th century. Seriously. But we don't know that because we don't study it, right? We just, we hear it because of the Chicano movement, we understand that, but we don't understand the ideological foundation. Jose Vasconcelos is actually Spanish elite from Mexico who was actually writing about his philosophy and he was a eugenist. You guys know what eugenist is? No? No. Okay, so eugenist is someone that believes that uh, if you mix this person with this person, you'll get the best genes, right? So this mix the whitest with the whitest and the mixed genes. We shouldn't let black people, you know, procreate. We shouldn't let indigenous people procreate. Only white people should procreate because we, we don't want to have all these backwards people in our country. That's his. Obviously, I'm, I'm restating what he said. But those are his philosophies. Jose Vasconcelos, that's how close we got. Eugenics, racism, not just against us, everybody. Black, Chinese, everything. And I have another presentation you guys are interested where I have actual sources, quotes from his book. So this is really important. It's really important for us to understand this, right? That these concepts and these terms are political. They carry conquest. And talking about demonizing, so you, you're right, we have the Raza Cosmica view, we have this myth of the beautiful Spanish conquest, then we have these ideas, right, of who we are. Let me tell you, this screenshot, guess what this is? It's a game. Yeah. This is a video game. And how many points you get depends on who you kill, right? If you kill a pregnant lady, maybe 20 points. This is an actual video game that people play, right? This is, from what I grew up in, the, with Prop 187 and the walkout, this is what we're up against? This is normal to people. Playing these games is normal. And again, we have the continuation, and then let me point this out. Do you guys know Ask a Mexican? He was a famous uh, writer. He's actually, he's actually Mexican. Gustavo Arellano, right? He actually created this cartoon, and he's Mexican. So what does that show? That we internalize, right? That mockery, that we internalize that view of ourselves. So, how much longer do I have? Sorry, I can go. That's fine. Yeah, okay. And so, getting into the population, being a little bit more um, strategic with numbers here, when we actually look at what makes up the Hispanic category, in the Latino category, you're gonna find that it's Mexicans, obviously, and then we have other uh, non-white uh, peoples on there, Salvadorians, Guatemalans, Colombians. We make up the majority of these labels, and yet, again, like we've learned, it's marketing, right? Why is it that a Cuban could be Cuban, where? Miami, right? A Puerto Rican could be Puerto Rican, and New York, but well, why can't we be Mexican and Central American in LA, right? There's like that negative connotation. Well, because identity is power, right? Identities that connect you to Europe, that connect you to a culture of Spain, that doesn't give you power if you're here on this land. But if you're being, if you're, if you're reclaiming identities that connect you to this land, that empowers you to stay here because you acknowledge that you can, you are connected to this land. So why are we being forced to take on these identities that don't honor that connection? And like I said, speaking Spanish doesn't make us Spanish. We're not all mixed. If you look at the populations of Mexico, Central America, and other places in South America, there's a big population of our people that are not full blood. I mean, that are, that are full blood, that are not mixed. And so that, what that does is try to portray that there's not that many indigenous people left. You know, this era came and went, we're all mixed now, let's move on, that's the past. And this is where it gets into actually, how do we challenge this? Well, the work that I've been doing is challenging it through social media, through education, through reclaiming academia. Because for a long time, I thought I couldn't study this in academia. I was just gonna be taught a bunch of white lies and it's all gonna be like, you know, pink. But I'm actually understanding that there's a lot of power in academia and that there's a lot to be done, a lot of research to be done. And so there's memes like this, saying one people, one continent, no European borders, acknowledging the fact that before these borders, we're all migrating on this continent, right? 
And then we have, this is an actual uh, picture of March 2007, of the Gran Marcha. Those are some of the signs that we hold up. And now I'll get to the act. <laughs> um, so this is a little bit more of my experience here. Uh, like I said, I do, I talk at different high schools, at different universities. This is us protesting last year in Huntington Park where the actual Minutemen, uh, the actual Trump supporters were actually going, they're actually doing this now. They're going into city halls demanding that it, um, that they take away that their fees that are from a sanctuary city and demanding that they follow um, legal regulations as far as uh, documentation, as far as immigration. So they want people to be able to be deported on the spot. That's what the Trump supporters want. And that's why they're going to Cudahy, they're going to Huntington Park, they're going to Wilmington, and this is what they do. And so me and a group of friends, we've been challenging that. We've been challenging that, and a lot of these people, let me tell you, they're not the most educated white people. They're very aggressive, they carry weapons. I had a friend that they stuck a knife out on him. Um, they pepper sprayed a group of kids in Cudahy, California. And I mean, this is what we're up against. Like these people have no regard for our humanity, for our history, for who we are, and this is what we're seeing. Um, so anyway, that's part of reclaiming it, right? It's being, being able to defend our community for those of our people that can't or are too afraid because we're being terrorized by both of these groups. We have ICE, right, which is a terrorist organization. We have these Minutemen and these uh, Trump supporters who think they're ICE, right, and are harassing our community. Um, so we have to defend our community. That's me speaking at UC Riverside, um, in front of Huntington Park High School with my sign, The Poor White Supremacists to Europe. I have a YouTube channel that I started over 10 years ago. And here, as far as ELAC, let me tell you about ELAC. ELAC, I gotta tell you, this college is so important to me. This college saved my life. Like, I'm being serious with you. This college saved my life. When I was, when I graduated high school, I really didn't care about college. It was like, eh, I didn't have the grades. I didn't have a high school diploma. So, anyway, that's the long story. Um, so when I came here, I met um, Oscar Valeriano. I don't know if he's still here. He was a dean of student services. And he offered me resources. He offered me counseling. I got a job as a student assistant in financial aid. So it completely transformed my life being here. Um, when I was here at Yosemite College, we created what is called a Nawak Studies Club. And that was back in 2004 to 2009. And a Nawak, just to let you know, that means um, Mexico and Central America, that land mass. That's what it was called before. And so a Nawak Studies Club, what we would do is have uh, displays. We would come out into the, um, the, well, this is so different now. <laughs> but back then, it was a student um, area. And we would have meetings, we would have two-day events, we would have lectures, we would participate in the powwow, um, we would do poetry readings. I feel old. Um, so that's what we would do. And this is here at East LA College back in 2004. So it's been a while. But this college has been tremendous, tremendous. And let me tell you, the resources that I received here at East LA College, it really helped me um, continue and go on to what I'm doing now. And if you can see up here, that's Oscar Valeriano. I don't know if you guys know. He was a uh, dean of student affairs for about 10 years. Have you guys seen him? Is he probably young? No? No, okay. So he was awesome, you guys. He was actually one of the founding members of the group before Mecha. He was the actual founder of that group that was here at his at his college demanding ethnic studies. Um, he's a very historical person to speak to. He's very um, resourceful. He helps our community. Amazing person. Uh, so thanks to him, he actually instilled to say, you know what, go to college, you can do it, you can do this. Like, that math, because I struggled with math, you guys, like, oh my God, like, I don't know if it is like that now, but for me to transfer, I had to take math, and <laughs> take math, and I was like, and I started at the very lowest, so it was horrible. So he would tell me, you know, keep going, get tutoring, get this, get that, and I finally did it, right? Graduated in 2013, I received my Associates in Behavioral Sciences, and I threw myself the biggest AA party ever. That's what was supposed to be. Um, I had a taquero, I had a DJ. Like, it meant so much to me to be done and to be completed with this chapter of ELAC that I wanted to celebrate, right? Because uh, how many of you are going to go to, are here for your, your general education and are going to go on to, for university, right? That's what we focus on, right? Good, go, please, do it, do it, do it. And I would say, please get your math done. 
get out the way. Don't be like me. Like, oh my God. My transcripts were like, good grades, good grades. Math, W, W. I was like, until they changed it where you can only take it three times. So then I had to. Um, then I graduated from Casa de Ley with Sun Cum Laude, um, history, I'm a history major, and that's the highest honors. Um, and let me tell you, coming from high school, I did not ever imagine myself receiving the highest honors. At Casa de Ley for history, I did not think that was doable. Um, and right now, I'm in grad school, and focusing on history, my goal um, eventually is to teach here at East LA College. That is my ultimate dream. I want to teach here. I want either Chicago studies or history. I just feel so uh, intense. I feel powerfully for this campus. This campus is amazing. It's changed lives. It transforms lives. And it gives people the resources and the tools that we need to succeed, especially in our community that we need it. And just to let you know, I put that. So all of that to say that I published my book in 2013, um, it's actually being used in Cal State LA, and they're using it at Golden West College. And what you see here, this book, where did it go? Oh, it's over here. I actually, this is my self-made book from 1997. When I was in high school, I wrote this book, and I said, one day I will publish a poetry book. And so, luckily, I worked hard and I made it happen. So this became this. And what I want to tell you is that whatever dreams you guys may have, like tell me about you guys, what do you guys want to do? What, what are you majoring in? Give me some, what are you majoring in? Uh, math, beautiful, what do you want to do in math? Uh, I want to go back and uh, teach by uh, middle school. Perfect, uh, beautiful. How about yourself, what do you want to do? Um, engineering. Ooh. Beautiful, what do you want to do in? Doctor, math, doctor, or how about yourself? Oh, rehabilitation service. Oh, good. Counseling. Okay. All right, anyone else want to share what they're doing? They're majoring in? Yeah. Yeah, I'm actually a history major. A what? A history major. Yay, yay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I, I just want to let you guys know that, yeah, like it took, as you guys can see, it took me a while. You guys saw the years there. It took me a while, a long time to be able to finish high school, um, finish college, because I was on my own since I was 18, um, and luckily I, I didn't have the help or, or from friends or family, so luckily I had the resources here. I met amazing people. My best friends today, I met here at ELAP. Um, I continue to come here a lot for poetry readings and to speak, and I just think it's so powerful that you take ownership of your education, that don't let people tell you, oh, no, I don't think you can do that, don't, don't, don't shoot for that, you, you should settle for this. Don't let anyone tell you that, because those are the people that want to, want to keep you at a certain level, they don't want to see you succeed, they don't want to see your power blossom. And let me remind you that just being here today is an accomplishment. Okay, how many of you have seen the Chicago Educational Pipeline? Not familiar with it? Okay, so real quick. So, this is a study that was done and this keeps replicating. So they followed 100 Chicano students, right? They followed them through elementary school. So out of 100 Chicanos that went to elementary school, 46 graduate high school, right? 26 enroll in college, 17 go to community college, nine go to a four-year college, eight graduate with a BA degree, um, and then one transfers to a four-year college, and then two earn a graduate or professional degree, and point two graduate with a doctoral degree. So this is why I tell you that you being here and you following your dream, whether it's math, doctor, engineering, rehabilitation, history, you're already making yourself history, you're making a huge accomplishment, you're representing a number of people that don't want this to be a reality, right? Why is it so hard? Why, why isn't it 2,000, 3,000, right? And that's what we're here, and that's why it's so important for you to take ownership of your education, whatever it is. Echenle ganas, accomplish, ask questions. Don't, don't feel that, that you're not capable. And most importantly, I'm here to tell you to reclaim this space. This space, you know how many people denied generations before? We're not supposed to be here. We're not supposed to be getting educated, right? Statistically, we're not, we're going against the grain here, right? I didn't see myself going to college. I didn't. 
I barely, I didn't even graduate from high school. I had to go to adult school. None of my, my family members were college students. My mom wasn't there checking on my grades, right? So it takes a certain amount of, of, of commitment and dedication for yourself. How many of you are first generation going to college? Beautiful. That's beautiful. That's an accomplishment. You have people that are looking at you, people that are seeing that you're going to be role models for people that you don't even know, right? There's people watching you and getting inspired, and you don't even know, right? And as crazy as these ideas may have sounded today, right? Because it does sound like, what is this song about? Um, but I've been studying this for 20 years, and I didn't think I could study this and speak and, and do what I'm doing at the college level, because I was told that's too crazy. That's too radical. They're never going to listen to that in academia. Right? And now I'm receiving the highest honors. My professors are encouraging. They're supportive of me. Um, and I'm like, yeah, because they think it's crazy, but I have receipts for days. Right? I have studies. I have research. I, have, I can back up everything I'm saying. And that's what is very uh, fearful for the other side. Right? Other people wish that we didn't know so much or commit so much or we're doing anything with our lives. But we are. And we're changing it. And I'm so happy to be here. Like when I was walking on campus, I was telling my sister, oh my god, I don't, I don't, I don't remember this building. This building was like falling apart, you guys. Like I was like in class, the blocks were falling off on students. Like it was crazy. This was like early 2000s. So this campus has transformed not only itself, but the people, right? The students, the staff. And with that, I just want to say thank you. Tlaso Gamati, to Sicily, um, to Puente, and all of you guys. I want to thank you for listening to me rant on what I have to say. Um, and I'm very grateful, and I'm very appreciative, and I'm very, very proud of you guys. You know, I don't know your stories, but I know we all have a struggle. We all have a story, right? And I want you to know that we come from a long history of resistance, right? There was a walkout here. We weren't allowed to be in these schools. Right? This was not supposed to be happening, and we are doing it, and we are here, and we're taking ownership, and that's beautiful. And I want you guys to take that with you and kick ass whatever you do. Kick ass, represent your community, represent where you come from, and be like Elex. I'm gonna go buy my Elex sweater right now. Matter of fact, I couldn't afford it when I was here, but I can afford maybe one or just one. So with that, thank you so much. If you guys have any questions? Thank you.